Hello everybody, welcome. Uh, this is a lecture on genetics of viruses and bacteria. This is actually a little bit of chapter 17 and a little bit of chapter 15 in your textbook. Um, I, I sort of did it this way before because this was all combined in one chapter in the old textbook and I kind of liked it so I kept it this way. So I apologize for the confusion if you're trying to follow along in the textbook, but I think you'll be okay. They, they, these things sort of go together. So, um, of course, I tried to include some stuff at the end here. Since uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic, we are, um, I'm, I tried to do my best to include some information on the COVID-19 virus. So um, I will get to that, but that's going to sort of wait till the end of this. Um, so bacteria, let's start there. And not because they're simpler, they're not. Viruses are more simple than bacteria. However, we've done a little bit more with bacteria and you guys know a little bit more about it. So we'll start there and learn a little bit of new stuff here. But most of this you already know. Um, bacteria, for the most part, have a single chromosome. It's usually circular. It is found in an area of the cell called a nucleoid, since there is no nucleus. It is, um, there are occasionally small circular pieces of DNA in addition to the main chromosome, and we usually call those plasmids, um, and we may get into that in a little bit. But typically, the most common way the bacteria undergo reproduction is by simple binary fission. Binary fission is simply the cell dividing, and it is that you, before it actually occurs at the same time as DNA replication. DNA replication is happening. You attach one end of the chromosome to one side, one end to the other side of the cell. You divide the cell and you end up with two cells, each with a copy of the circular chromosome. Um, the rapid cell division means there are typically a lot of mutations. So bacteria mutate much more quickly than do eukaryotic cells. Um, but in addition to that, you also have um, some other changes to the DNA that help it survive longer. Now remember, going back to evolution, that genetic diversity increases the chance of survival of a species because the more that natural selection has to choose from, the better chances that you are going to survive. So um, bacteria, uh, maybe understand this is not the right word, but bacteria have evolved in the same world as everything else. So they understand that having lots of different types of DNA out there is actually a good thing. So there is a versions of bacterial sexual reproduction. It's not the same thing. They don't go through typical sexual reproduction. There's no male, there's no female. So a couple different ways that this happens. There is one that you already know of. It's called transformation. And essentially what happens here is that bacteria, especially when stressed, will grab onto a piece of genetic information that is floating around outside the cell. And the example you know is the Griffith experiment with the dead mice, um, where you had a dead version of a bacteria, a killed version of the bacteria that was actually giving genetic information to a living bacteria, bacterial strain. Um, that is transformation. And it's actually incredibly important in modern day biology because it's actually been our, the way in which we have learn to make DNA and get other organisms to take up DNA. So for example, we have done an experiment in AP Biology that is not practical now, obviously, but where we can take a piece of DNA that actually has a um, jellyfish gene integrated into it, it's called the green fluorescent protein, and we can actually get bacteria to take that piece of DNA into its cells and start producing it and start using it, and it, of course, makes the bacteria glow green. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, but that's transformation. And we've known about that for quite some time, and it's one way in which they diversified their genome is as they are able to take up this DNA that's sitting around there. Transduction is um, simply 
a accidental way that bacteria transmit DNA. If you have a bacteriophage, a, a virus that actually infects bacteria, sometimes the virus can actually take DNA from one bacteria and put it into another bacteria. This is common and it has also been demonstrated to occur in other species where we have clear evidence that a virus has transferred genetic information from one species to another and they could be very distantly related. Um, but that is something that happens and because of the nature of how quickly bacteria reproduce and how viruses affect them, transduction happens more commonly in bacteria than in anywhere else. Conjugation is probably the most um, closely close thing to sexual reproduction that bacteria go through. They literally will take two cells, they join, and they create these little um, tubes that are called sex pili. And a male, and notice that's in quotation marks because it's not a true male, but a male version of the bacteria will donate either a whole chromosome or a portion of their chromosome to the female. Um, and these, um, often it's either, it's usually one of these smaller pieces of DNA called a plasmid. And then, um, last but not least, transposable elements are section of bacterial chromosomes that can move around and they seem to have their, an independent nature. And, um, they are actually able to transfer sometimes from one bacteria to another. Um, the antibiotic resistance can sometimes be carried this way, and that's obviously particularly dangerous because you're actually getting that resistance spreading through uh, different types of bacteria. All right, how do bacteria determine when to turn genes on and genes off? This is incredibly important, and we'll talk a little bit today about bacteria and then we'll get into how eukaryotic organisms do it later on. Bacteria are a little bit simpler um, and a kind of elegant system. They use these systems called operons. And what they do is essentially they organize their DNA in, in a much better way than we do ours. So for example, bacteria may have um, a process, a metabolic pathway, that involves five or six enzymes. And so you need five or six genes to code for these five or six enzymes. What they do is they literally organize their DNA so that all of those genes occur in one specific spot. And you have a, a portion of DNA ahead of that called an operator. That operator turns the whole system on and off. So you have one switch that controls the genes for all of the things involved there. Um, so when you turn this switch on, and I know this is the switch is the it's a good analogy, but understand it's a it's a molecular biology switch that is actually switching the DNA on, and it's it's whether you're transcribing the DNA or not. Um, so you can turn the whole system on, or you can turn them off, and just so you know, like many things, this is not a true on-off. Often there is sort of a dimmer switch here that you can actually create a lot of transcribed RNA or a little bit of transcribed RNA, um, depending on where you are on this. Um, you produce these things called repressors. Repressors are essentially the off switch. So repressors will bind to the operator and essentially block it from the necessary components getting on there so that you can start transcription. Mainly, you can't hook up DNA polymerase 3, sorry, RNA polymerase, I apologize for that. So when you can't get RNA polymerase on there, you won't actually start transcription. Um, and you also have these proteins called activators that do the exact opposite. Activators actually promote transcription. So we've got some good images here. So first, um, this is an example of the TRIP operon. So TRIP is a 
um, what it's referring to is tryptophan. Tryptophan is a necessary amino acid, and bacteria sometimes need to be able to make tryptophan from this precursor up here. And in order to do that, they need several enzymes, one, two, three enzymes that's coded for by five genes, okay? So what we wanna be able to do is, when we have tryptophan, we wanna actually be able to turn on, we wanna be able to turn off this enzyme, Okay, that's we've already talked about that. That's 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 regulation of enzymes. But we also want to be able to turn off the making of these proteins. Why are we going to make these proteins if we don't need them? So that's where we get into the next thing. How do we stop this? So here this is complicated, but this is a bacteria DNA. Um, somewhere on the bacteria, and it's completely in a different spot than the rest of this. This is all in the same spot, but this promoter is coded for by a gene, and it makes messenger RNA, and it makes a protein, okay? And when the protein is made by itself, it is inactive. So when it is inactive, it will not interact with this operator. You can see it almost fits, but not quite. So when this is, the repressor is not repressing, that means that this promoter region will work. You will be able to transcribe this a whole series of genes, and you will then be able to create five separate polypeptides that make the enzymes, okay? So this is the operon when it is turned on. Here is the operon when it is turned off. When you have tryptophan, remember that whole, all those enzymes are to create tryptophan. Since you already have it, you don't need it. So tryptophan takes this repressor, binds with it, and it becomes active. When it's active, it will bind to the promoter region and it blocks this. So we can no longer transcribe the DNA, no longer make the messenger RNA, and no longer make the genes. Um, here's another example called the lac operon, which is very similar. It's just the opposite. You actually don't need something bound to the repressor to have it active. So the active form is without anything attached. So when um, this lactose, this regulatory lactose is, go is um, active, it will block this and it will not produce that. And that is because you don't have any lactose rep in your cells. So if you don't have any lactose in your cells, why would you want to produce the genes that break down lactose? So this is the version that is active where we actually have lactose in the cell. Look at that, it binds to this, it turns it inactive. Now we can actually turn this operon on and we can now make all these proteins that are necessary for breaking down lactose. But again, why would we make these unless we have lactose present? So it's a nice little system. Um, here's a second level to this, that there's actually another layer to this, that when we are activating this, let's say we have lactose in the cell. Okay, we want to make these genes, but we really, really want to make these genes even more so when we are running low on energy. And that's when we have this thing called cyclic AMP. So this is kind of like a supercharge to this operator that allows the, um, the this activator here that allows this to be double timed as far as production of enzymes. So in other words, we have, um, what's happening here is you've got lactose in the cell and you're running out of all other sugars. So if you have lactose and glucose, break down glucose, it's easy. But don't, um, when you do, you're running out of glucose and running out of ATP and therefore have lots of camp in the cell, now we gotta turn this on and double time it, okay? I'm gonna save the rest for the next video. I'll see you over there.